Welcome everyone to the uh, UCLA Center on uh, um, Longevity Center webinar today. We have um, Dr. Greg Cole, who's going to be talking about supplements and nutrition for brain health. So very excited to have uh, Dr. Cole here today. Um, just a little bit on his bio. Dr. Cole is a professor of neurology and medicine at UCLA and associate director for basic research at the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center at the Greater LA VA and Geriatrics Division in the Department of Medicine at UCLA. So he's served five years as the interim director um, after more than 20 years as the associate director of the Mary Easton Alzheimer's Center here at UCLA. So he received his undergraduate degrees in physics and biochemistry from UC Berkeley and worked at Harvard Medical School, returned to UC Berkeley for a doctoral program on Alzheimer's and aging. And he also has worked at UCSD's Alzheimer's Center from 1986 to 1993 before coming to UCLA and the VA. He is also a recipient of the Churkin Award for Research on Brain Aging. So without further delay, um, welcome Dr. Cole and we're very much looking forward to your talk. And I just wanna remind our, our viewers to, if you have any questions, please put it into the Q&A, not, not the chat, but the Q&A. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I, I was just going to add that I've served on the uh, panels reviewing grants for supplements that the National Complementary uh, and Alternative Medicine Center, now renamed Complementary and Integrative Health Center. Um, so I've seen a lot of the proposals to test supplements, the rationales uh, around the supplements. And then because I'm a uh, aging, I'm interested in what's good for me and what isn't and what's a waste of time. So the, the, there are examples all the time of people uh, advertising devices or supplements uh, that you see on TV, cable in particular. And I, I give an, two examples here of uh, this red light therapy to enhance your testosterone levels that uh, Tucker Carlson had and then um, some of the supplements that Alec Jones has. But there are many of these people on TV, you see the ads all the time for this supplement or that supplement. And uh, you either are skeptical or not about whether or not they, they work. So I usually try to look up some of this stuff. And that's the kind of thing I'm gonna talk about. Uh, let's see. Will this kindly advance? How can it not advance now? There we go. Okay. So the disclosure is that I'm on a, a, a patent for a curcumin formulation uh, that's UCLA licensed to Verger with this Sally that I think Sally already talked about some. So this is the, uh, the kind of thing that we see where they're selling supplements and then you see that, like, this is one that was being advertised on various sites, including Alex Jones's site with green coffee. And then the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has put, put in, you know, made them pay actual fines for misleading advertising. And the evidence that they were citing has been retracted. So that, that's what I'm showing here. So they're, they're basically all sorts of supplements where the evidence that they claim is quite debatable, but well, supplements are not regulated the same way as drugs. So you usually have to have the FTC or the FDA go after the people and they're, they're loath to do that because it's a lot of work to go after people advertising things that just don't work. Um, this is uh, Alex Jones's brain force product, which has things in it that have a rationale and when the analysis is done, the, these things are actually in it, which is not always true. Um, but the combinations that people come up with don't necessarily work in combination. So that's another big issue is that the people selling patented supplements may have some kind of rationale for each 
individual ingredient, but no testing. So for, for, for the combination and then the dosing issues in these supplements are often questionable, especially where they're mixing a combination and they may be well under what was the effective dose for any one of these things in any kind of evidence-based uh, analysis. This is an example of Dr. Oz's recommendations that were being analyzed in a 2014 paper. Um, there was about 47% were a panel of fellow Columbia faculty members, about 10 of them, I think, eight to 10 faculty members reviewed the scientific basis of his advice, including advice on supplements and found that about half of it didn't have any basis that they would accept. Um, and 47% was overall had some level of evidence. So they did the same analysis for a, a show called Doctors and came up with more or less the same conclusions that there, uh, about half, that's the direct quote, of the recommendations have either no evidence or contraindicated by the best available evidence. So we're getting information off of advertisements that are not regulated in TV um, programs where people have conflicts of interest, for example, or basically selling the products or in business with people selling products. And it's not clear what's reliable and what isn't. The National Center for Complementary and Integr Integrative Health, the NCCIH, has been charged by the NIH to, to deal with some of the supplement issues. So they're studying and advising consumers on supplements. They have a website that you should probably go to if you're interested in this business and see what kind of things they say. So for example, on the topic that I'm trying to address today, supplements and cognitive function, they that's their title, dietary supplements. And then they cover things like ginkgo, omega-3, curcumin, vitamin E, and B vitamin issues. And you'll see information at Mayo, Harvard, and other academic sites uh, where they're doing that. They have a health newsletter and they try to cover some of these same things. In my estimation, they're less informed than they need to be. And they're kind of retailing uh, the wholesale information that you could get at the NCI, NCCIH website. If you wanna see what the consensus views are that their committees come up with. I have to tell you that the committees are not uh, unanimous. And so what you're getting is sort of like a academic jury verdict of these things. To distinguish supplements from drugs, uh, the FDA approves compounds or biologicals after expensive clinical trials that meet their primary endpoints. Now those trials have responders and non-responders and you don't understand in the end whether or not there's a subgroup of people that a drug that failed might actually really work in, uh, or whether the, uh, uh, the, the, the specific conditions of testing meet the criteria for your use or not, but you're trusting the FDA to have a sort of uh, approval that suggests that more often than not, it would work for you in a nutshell. Uh, that's from placebo-controlled trials. Supplements are also compounds or chemicals. Um, so they're really no different. And the idea that they're a natural product makes it safe doesn't uh, have any real legitimacy. What it means is that the dosing in the, the, the foods that are edible uh, has been uh, uh, not insufficient to cause a lot of toxicity if the foods were considered edible. If there's some extract, they may concentrate uh, the, a toxic chemical. So that's the reason that NCCIH tries to review some of the issues with the extracts that people produce. They try to try to adequately characterize the extracts, which we reason uh, more often than not are not adequately characterized. Somebody has a process, it varies depending upon the source of the of the bio, of the product. I mean, to give you one specific example, if you take turmeric root grown in uh, areas with a lot of industrial contamination, which often occurs in, in, in overseas in places like China and India, where they don't have strict environmental controls, you can have a lot of heavy metal contamination. And then that will extend to other potential 
um, uh, natural products where the extracts may or may not enrich for or include uh, contaminants, just industrial waste contaminants, because the factories and the fields are just sort of mixed together. So there's nothing that guarantees that a claim of natural product actually makes something safe. Um, it, 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 the, 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 and then the efficacy issue is always uh, about dose. And because the FDA doesn't really supervise this, there's wildly varying evidence of efficacy for all, all of the things that get sold as supplements. Um, let me give an example of something more specific, Prevagen, which is heavily advertised and recommended as a memory supplement. Uh, its active ingredient is something called apoacorin, a protein originally found in jellyfish. Uh, and the claim is that it's producing healthy brain function, sharper mind, better memory, clearer thinking uh, but as advertised. And they have variable strengths. And it says right on the bottle, clinically tested, improves memory. If you actually go to the clinical trial data, let's see if this thing will advance. Let's, well, actually, first, let's just say what it is. It's a 21 kilodalton protein. What does that mean? That means that it's much larger than uh, uh, the small molecules that are about, let's say, uh, a hundredth the size that might get into brain normally. Uh, so it's, it's very large, and it's uh, a protein. The, in the jellyfish, it's binding to calcium. So it's a calcium binding protein. And in the jellyfish, it, it's producing light in response in the uh, photoluminescent uh, jellyfish. Now, the, the reason people tried to test it is because calcium plays a role in lots of neuronal processes. And this thing could potentially sequester that calcium. Uh, so the paper that supposedly it, uh, involves the clinical trial is this. There's only one clinical trial, it's this. And they made a claim that they had a difference, a positive effect here at day 90 here. So you see this, this is the sort of data. It's a small number of patients um, uh, in, in the trial. And the director of marketing from the company is one of the key people uh, manufacturing, basically it's from the, the company here that's selling the Prevagen supplement. The, uh, this was the claim, 218 subjects that you got an improvement. Uh, now, the, the argument was that it protected hypoxia and cultured neurons. That's because it's calcium binding that it can do that. Anything calcium binding can do that in culture. And the, there's a large degree of variation in the results uh, with a 5% increase supposedly in the effect size. So FDA took a look at this in FTC and they basically um, were irritated by it. Um, the, there's a lawsuit that was uh, um, introduced, a class action lawsuit against the manufacturers and the manufacturers, the, the, the lawyers in the lawsuit um, uh, emphasize that there's no oral absorption of large intact proteins. So basically, in general, proteins are digested uh, into a, their into the amino acid mix by the stomach. That's what the acid and enzymes in your stomach are doing, uh, trypsin, pepsin, and so on. So you're digesting it, but it's taken orally. So you don't get to use insulin orally as a general rule or other uh, these, these, these uh, diabetes drugs that are peptides, they don't absorb orally, but they didn't assess this here or so they said uh, that what you do get is some small pieces of, of, a, of a, a protein like dipeptides and tripeptides and then the individual amino acids. So one, two or three of the amino acids, not the whole thing that could be functional. There are uh, amino acids that are absorbed and repackaged into proteins for humans. Uh, that th This is not going to happen. So that it, scientifically, it doesn't look like that could work. Now, the FDA 
uh, uh, argues that uh, they inspect this kind of stuff to see if the pro you might get a be allergic to a pro must not be allergenic. So the company submitted forms to the FDA to say, look, we don't have a problem with this. And they said here, the, the aquaport, this is the, the company provided information. It's digested or enzymatically hydrolyzed to individual amino acids that can be absorbed uh, uh, in the digestive tract. So the company itself and its safety submission said, look, we don't have an issue with causing allergies with our protein being absorbed, a foreign protein from jellyfish. You don't need to regulate that because our product is actually completely digested in, in, in the gut. So uh, they submitted evidence that it was digested by, by within two minutes. So because they did this, um, the, 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 the uh, FDA said, look, this thing can't be, it's completely hydrolyzed and it can't be effective. So they basically said, stop saying that this has efficacy in clinical trial. Your clinical trial is flawed. The, the thing is actually digested, as you yourself say to us. Uh, and if you look at their evidence that it does something, what they do is go infuse directly into the brain. For example, this is a 2020 study with their peptide from their sinus. They don't put it in the, through the GI tract. They infuse it into the brain where you don't have these issues. So the science behind it is really pretty bad based on th this these factors. On the other hand, they have an estimated 3 million customers, $165 million in sales as of maybe this is probably four years old. Uh, and they, the class action lawsuit against them was settled and they had, you know, you could, you could try to get your share of, of, uh, of that. Uh, so uh, now the ads, still they advertise it, but they focus on anecdotes and testimonials. So there's no longer a, a clinical trial evidence claim because they, they, they were, that was basically the banned. Now, here's the issue with all these products, that anecdotal evidence and testimonials is not particularly reliable. What happens is you have widely varying outcomes due to multiple unknown factors in clinical trials and in life, and including use of a drug or supplement, people often make conclusions about efficacy or inefficacy, and they make those conclusions based on bad data. Uh, it's, so... To give you an example with COVID and hydroxychloroquine, um, the outcomes with COVID are quite variable. Some people go to a party, they're exposed. Other people are exposed. You get it, they don't. No one knows why. Um, the outcomes in terms of do you have symptoms or not are incredibly variable. So people can take or not take hydroxychloroquine and get a, a different outcome independent of whether it does anything and decide that it's worked for me and give testimonials. So the fact is, is that if you look at random reinforcement in any setting, for example, if you put pigeons in a cage that are randomly reinforced, the pigeons try to figure out uh, what is it that they got to do to get a, a, a reward of a food, a food? And they end up creating little dances, different dances with each pigeon that figured out that it was getting um, uh, the reward when they'd actually stepped up on one foot, raised the right wing first, put the other foot out. And they have really absurd and interesting little dances just because the reward uh, is, is, is randomly rewarded. The pigeons concluding, well, this dance worked for me. Uh, and this is what people do with the things that they're doing in their, their, their uh, evaluation of, of uh, a lot of supplements. Um, it doesn't mean that it didn't work for you. It is possible that it did work for you. That's the real problem here. In the case of the pigeons, we know it wasn't their dance. Um, but in the case of your health outcome, you're not sure, right? Did it work for you? Is there some genetic issue with you? You're different than the other people that it didn't work with. You say sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. 
does it really need to work for everybody in a, in a randomized placebo controlled trial for it to work with you? So I'm asking you to think about that when you consider what kind of evidence you actually need to produce to show that anything is working for you. Uh, it worked before. Uh, it seemed to work this time, but not that time. And you see the, the level of difficulty here in deciding what is working and why based on just on outcomes. Now, here's another example, Nareva, that gets advertised a lot with Miam, Miam um, Bialik, uh, a UCLA uh, neuroscience uh, PhD, uh, who advises that coffee, fruit, extract, polyphenol, uh, in it, the Nareva is working, and the key is the coffee, che coffee cherry extract. Well, the manufacturer settled to pay $8 million in April 2021 uh, over the issue of whether or not this was backed by science. So now we get testimonials because the data are actually really not there. So um, I, I, I'm not going to belabor it, but I'm happy to talk about it later if you want to know what's wrong with it. Um, so there are many examples of people that had legitimate preclinical evidence for something and took them into trials. So things with some long history of use like ginkgo and ginseng have actually been put in big trials and been not been effective in those trials at reducing Alzheimer risk or re reducing cognitive decline. Now that doesn't mean that they don't have any activity. Uh, it just means that in those big trials with as many as 5,000 subjects, they just didn't work for the total group. So there's no evidence to support that they work. The, a, a scientifically designed, both of those are supposed to have antioxidant properties and they do have some. Uh, an antioxidant cocktail that was carefully designed with best available expertise included vitamin E, vitamin C, alpha lipoid and coenzyme Q10, all of which you see advertised um, in, in you know various products, and unfortunately, in this trial with this combination, it failed to improve anything. And in fact, they looked at the biomarkers from taking cerebral spinal fluid, where they could see pretty good biomarkers for Alzheimer's, and things got worse instead of better when they put this this carefully designed mix together. So. When people take a mix of things that each have a rationale and put them together, it doesn't mean that they'll work well together. And that's 95% of the supplement stuff that you see. Somebody has taken a set of things. They said, oh, this worked in that study, and it might be a small study, and there's another one and another one. And they throw them all together and call it you know, brain force or Nareva or whatever it is without actually running the trials to see you know, how well it works and in whom. Another example of an antioxidant that's been actually fairly heavily tested is vitamin E. Now, it, it had shown some positive benefits in one trial run by NIH, by Mary Seno, and then it, 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 it didn't show benefits in another trial, but then in a lar very large VA study with many more subjects, it actually looked like it worked a bit. So it did something. The problem is they used two... 2000 IU, which is a very high dose, and the most people have issues with this. Well, they didn't test lower doses. That's one problem. But if you, it's competitively absorbed and not that well by brain. So vitamin E takes a long time to get into brain, and it's competing with all the natural tocopherols or vitamin E forms. And those have other activities that I could discuss later that you really don't want to lose. It also competes with the absorption of vitamin K, which is controlling blood clotting. So there's some problems with high dose vitamin E uh, at the levels that they used in this trial and the benefits were mild. Nonetheless, it's an example of something that got some testing. So if we go to other supplements that might actually do something, vitamin A, you need adequate vitamin A, but you don't want to exceed the 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 uh, recommended daily allowances. And you can go to any of these websites and see some of the reasons why it, there are toxic side effect issues with you know, overdosing vitamin A. Vitamin D is the one that's most interesting in a way because 
there's pretty good evidence that it has anti-inflammatory effects, that in the epidemiology, it's reducing cardiovascular disease or you know, vascular disease and dementia risk. And there are potential other health benefits for it. So it's a very interesting one. People give you different recommendations. The current consensus is about 800 IU for people over uh, age 71. So um, that's an actual uh, above what you're normally getting in diet and uh, the, you would be getting it primarily from fish consumption. So it's interesting that it, 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 the, one of the major sources for both A and D that are lipid soluble is the fatty fish or fish consumption. And there's an argument that, that vitamin D may be a component that's not really in most omega-3, but that it's an argument for eating fish instead of taking the omega-3 supplement. This arena has now been studied actually fairly well by the Vital study. So I put the website down there, but if you just Google Vital study and you, you can see the information on it. This is interesting because this was a study with about 26,000 people that uh, has addressed the issue of supplementing people uh, in the trial with vitamin D and vitamin uh, and, and omega-3 fatty acids, two of the ingredients that you would be getting from eating fish. So they're really looking at supplements as a substitution for eating fish. Uh, and in this trial, this is the, the, these are these points in black here are their outcomes. They had uh, people that are older, they're asking, is it worth doing these supplements? And they're saying they did not individually reduce the risk of cancer although there were effects in the subset of African-Americans on cancer, uh, it did not reduce major cardiovascular events, it says, considered together. However, if you go down and look at uh, the, the supplements, the, the omega-3 reduced the risk of heart attack by 28%. Now, that's not bad. Um, uh, if you go look at some of the websites, they'll say omega-3 but were thought to work, but they don't really work when you compare people who are taking um, the, the lipostatin or other statins. They're taking um, statin drugs to lower cholesterol. And in the context of doing that, you don't see as good effects of omega-3, although sudden death from heart attack is actually still reduced by omega-3 supplementation. So I take omega-3 because I'm not enthused about having sudden death from a heart attack. Uh, and I think that the evidence is fairly good. It's better in the strongest Americans. And if you go look at the, the website, they'll tell you what their conclusions are. If you're not eating two fish meals a, a, a week, then you probably should do some supplementation. That's their recommendation. They've not yet included the cognitive endpoints, but they're coming out any day. Now they've added in sub, you know, to address the specific issue of brain health, they've added in cognitive endpoints of looking at depression incidents and cognitive decline. So we'll see that what they're doing there. This is is actually the kind of thing that needs to be done. Uh, B vitamins have some evidence. Now the issue there is really, do you have a, a, a population that's B deficient? The most obvious one is B12 or folate. The folate deficiency does associate with um, vascular disease and uh, uh, vascular dementia risk. In the UK, where they don't have laws that require uh, fortification of the wheat products, you see good results, particularly from the Optima studies at Oxford. They have a whole bunch of them. But in the United States, They've, they've mandated fortification of wheat. So a bowl of cereal delivers enough folate to be protective. Uh, so so the, the issue is what's the population getting with this folate? People typically say you want 400 micrograms a day for protection. But, and when they say protection of executive function, that's one of the things that really fails with the vascular component to your cognitive decline. So this is one where there's some evidence there's a benefit. And of course, if you drink a lot of alcohol, 
you get other deficiencies like thiamine. So if you have cognitive decline, people would test for thiamine deficiency. Fortification of, with thiamine, with a B vitamin, might, might be helpful. So there's some argument for B vitamins. If you test them for against symptoms, they don't improve symptoms, but there's a, an argument for prevention. Another supplement that might do something, CDP choline or Cognizant is marketed uh, uh, in uh, various products. Uh, it improves phosphatidylcholine synthesis, which includes uh, incorporation of omega-3 fatty acid like DHA. So it may interact with that. Uh, there, uh, uh, there are other possible mechanisms. This is this is uh, phosphatidylcholine is one of the key fatty acids in the brain. And what you need these things for is building new uh, arbor, new uh, new connectivity, new synapses. Because what you have is an individual neuron with a huge surface area because it may have ten thousand different synapses. So it's got all these branches that all have to be encased by new membrane. So it, the building of new synapses and new connections and reinforcing memories and so on, that probably needs new phosphatidylcholine synthesis. So this is where this might have a pretty clear um, efficacy. There's animal model studies to support benefits from it. It doesn't, the, the, the data for dementia overall were kind of weak, particularly in the United States when they did some testing on this. It's been more used in uh, Asia. So where, where uh, uh, it may have more benefit because they have more vascular dementia. There are also some interactions with APOE that I could discuss, um, which is a, a, a big risk, a genetic risk factor, an important genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So if you just look at fish oil and omega-3, uh, when you can also get algal oil, which is primarily DHA and doesn't contain the other fatty acid, the long chain marine fatty acid that's in fish oil. They have good support in uh, preclinical studies in mice, but the results in people have been somewhat mixed. Some small trials show success, other large trials don't show success. In the multi-domain trials that people do that are ongoing and uh, overall successful, they usually try to make sure that people are omega-3 sufficient, either by eating fish or taking supplements. So they've been a component of studies that have shown success, but it's unclear what parts of the multi-domain intervention. That when I say multi-domain, I mean they're asking people to exercise, take get get adequate omega three, um, you know, um, use their brain more than one 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 intervention. Uh, so lower the Greg, their, yes. Excuse me, Greg. Can I can I interrupt you for a second? Please, um, please. We have questions coming in and one just came in that was very relevant to the folic okay. acid slide okay. that you just pre presented. Um, sure. The question is, do you distinguish between the folic acid used to fortify cereals and other wheat products and folate? And so the second half is the MTFH FR genetic variant makes it difficult to excrete mm -hmm. synthetic folic acid and is supposed to benefit from folate. Yeah, so so that's a reasonable point. I mean, there are, there are, so there are genetic variants that affect absorption of many of these things, and the, the the whether or not a synthetic form of folate uh, is absorbed better than a natural form of folate is it's it's certainly possible. In general, folate is folate. That in terms of you know what what it does is, is it's part of the um, the the active sites of enzymes, so it's used it's used as a cofactor to make your enzymes work. A specific subset, the folate that's there that's a synthetic folate is no different than the folate that that is the natural product folate. However, the natural product folate may be you know, in a form that makes it more bioavailable. That's possible. And it may depend on your genetics. So that's the level of, co of complexity that comes up with this. There may be personalized issues 
where some people don't absorb as well. The same is certainly true of omega-3 fatty acids, that they're genetic variants that affect uh, absorption. So in a in the in the kind of study you'd really like to see would be to, to examine those genetic variants in the large study like the Vital study with the use of these things, particularly in a prevention mode rather than a treatment mode. So the problem is, is that that when they test these things, you're not really going into treatment modes most of the time. Uh, oh, sorry, you 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 go in. Sorry, you do go into a treatment mode because it's easier to test people with active disease than to try to, to ward off elephants. Right? It's like prevention is way harder and involves way more money. So these kind of questions don't get adequately addressed in large populations. Right? So so. Uh, are there other questions that are hanging out there that I should just stop and address? Yeah, someone else asked a question that re relates to money, which you just mentioned, which was, do you agree that the reason for limited studies on supplements as compared to pharmaceuticals is because there is literally no money in supplements as compared to launching a pharmaceutical? Uh, yes and no. The, let me go to the no part first. There's a lot of money in supplements. There's billions of dollars, something like $100 billion in supplements. So it's it's not a trivial amount of money. The issue is what's a company's market position. So if I pay for a clinical trial with a supplement that anyone else can produce, then I don't have adequate patent protection. Then it, I'm paying for the research for other people's products. So I don't want to invest in that because I can't increase the price of my product. I don't get an exclusive position on it as with the patent medicine where I can charge an arm and a leg for it. So I got to be out there in the end, I got to be out there in the competitive space with people saying, making claims about the efficacy of whatever um, their version of it is that didn't, didn't, didn't pay for the, for the testing. So the guy trying to recoup money on his investment in clinical research is at a loss uh, compared to the guy just trying to take advantage of his clinical research and say X works, mine's cheaper on the shelf sitting next to it. So there is certainly that problem there that 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 so it's a it's a, a perfectly valid point. Money is making a big difference in what happens. Yes, absolutely. But it's a little yes and no issue. Yeah, I mean, by hearing, you know, your, your talk thus far, it, I mean, there are so many complex issues and you're a scientist, right? How does the average person sift through all of this if they want to take a supplement? Even some of the ones that you mentioned about that have some efficacy or some effectiveness, um, it's all about, you know, even like how they're produced, right? How, how they're tested and what types of uh, subjects, et cetera. How does the average consumer like know what to do, right? You go to Costco or maybe you buy your, uh, your supplements online. How the heck do you know what you're getting and what you should, right? It's just so daunting. No, no, it's a chorus of competing claims, right? Yeah. So I think that, it, that it's, 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 you can you I think that you get your best advice from say the NCCIH which is deliberately as unbiased as possible um, so I would accept that what they say has some degree of validity right it's like nothing's perfect people make scientific claims and tell you you know don't eat butter eat margin and then they come back and the expert panel says you know, you you should have been eating margarine margarine you shouldn't have should have been eating butter instead of margarine so right my father read the harvard news health letters and the mayo health letters and after his his heart attack and bypass he woke up and he said what happened and i said you had a heart attack and he said it was the margarine <laughs> Right. Must have been the margarine. <laughs> so uh, I remember yeah. those days yeah. Yeah. when they were everybody was being told to take margarine. Unfortunately, that happened in my family, yeah. and there was a heart attack in my family. Yeah. So, yeah. and you don't, you still don't know, know, right? What, but, right. but you're looking at it with some skepticism because it's changed. 
So I think that, that it's a complex question of what to eat and what not to eat and what supplements to take. I think there's very clear arguments for taking some supplements where you just don't get enough to get the health benefits that the clinical trial evidence shows are yeah. real. So I think the Vital trial is making a dent in that effort. Uh, people have been trying to do this with omega-3 uh, in the Alzheimer's space. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about one of them, unless you want to go back to questions. I, well, I'll, I'll I'll run some of the questions by you, and let's see. Um, okay. We've, we've had a few questions on uh, specific supplements, like, let me name a few, Al algae cow. I don't know if you've heard about that for osteoporosis. Mm-hmm. Um, another, another one is the quality of, of turmeric. And we did have, um, Dr. Fauci came, Fauci came and talked about that, or Fauci came and talked about that, uh, about curcumin, but you've also have done expense, extensive research in that area. So we've had, we have one question on, uh, turmeric and what, you know, what people should be using, what's dose. Yeah. For, so let me get. I'll that. get to. The, I'll get to that. I'm not familiar with the al algae cow. If you, if somebody emails me, uh, or I can look it up, uh, what are the ingredients? Right. So that's a brand of something produced, I assume, in algae, um, but I don't know. I don't know what it is. Sorry. Okay. Um, I can. And so you're going to get to the turmeric. We don't have yeah, that I'll much get... time left. So why don't okay. we? Why did we get to the turmeric? Okay, well, let me just buzz through the Souvenade, which is a mix that people okay. actually put together and tested. Okay, that and sounds great. It has some evidence base for it. So this is because Dan and Yogurt was springing for the, the, the testing. It, this is the 36-month trial date of Lipity Diet. So if you take these slides, you can stare at them. They're making claims of long-term improvement in patients with AD less brain shrinking and a slower cognitive decline. So it's not so bad from a supplement. It's a, it's a cocktail that was produced, modified, and clinically tested. It's in, it's more or less like B vitamins, the CDP choline I was mentioning, and omega-3. It's, it's just an alternative to the CDP choline. Um, curcumin uh, has these issues with poor bioavailability. That's the biggest issue. It, it's produced by ex organic solvent extraction from turmeric root if it's made as a supplement. And you see 95% curcuminoids or something like that. That means that they took the uh, an organic solvent, which means something like, um, well, there's a variety, but like alcohol. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they evaporate off the solvent. Let's say it's alcohol, which is an organic solvent. Uh, so the, the, then they get a dried powder. The problem is that dried powder, the number, the first problem is that dried powder, you put it in a capsule, it doesn't go back into water. So right. it's, so it's, so, so 95% of it goes into the toilet and you can assay that it's been done. So that's one problem. Uh, another problem is that as it gets into the GI tract, if it's soluble, it gets detoxified by a detoxification pathway, which really means that it's modified to make it secreted by the kidney in this particular pathway. So that's aggressively uh, uh, pursued in the human GI tract in general. So the humans have a more aggressive uh, modification of it. It doesn't mean that it's toxic. When I say de de detoxified, it, what it means is modified for secretion. So it's a protective mechanism so that whatever you're eating that's potentially toxic, and there's a pile of natural product things that are in there, you're detoxifying them to, for removal sort of automatically on the basis of a general recognition system, meaning it's like an innate immune system. It's a chemical recognition system for detoxification. You have a bunch of these in, uh, in the liver, but also, you know, and, and you can think of these things as systems that also metabolize drugs. So normally people say, well, how, how well is this drug absorbed? Well, the drugs are handled by the same kind of systems. And so curcumin's aggressively eliminated by this kind of system. So in order to make it work better, 
you need to put it in some kind of fat that, to deal with this absorption. You can do that in different ways and different products have addressed that. You can also associate it with some kind of a carrier that's not fat. And then um, uh, there are also there are efforts to do that. So mm -hmm. it's basically keep it, uh, deal with the solubility issue. Most of these supplements don't deal with the issue of rapid metabolism. And then when they report on it, say it's absorbed, they, they were, they're usually measuring the metabolized form that's targeted for secretion. The problem with that is that it, 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 once it's modified for secretion, it does not get into the brain. So it, you're basically inactivating it. And then they, as proof of, of superior bioavailability, they measure the inactivated form. So that's just effective. Um, so, you know, this is just some stuff about that. We made a formulation that's lipidated and designed to prevent it from falling apart uh, and protecting it from detoxification to some extent, mm -hmm. uh, meaning elimination. And we get reasonable bioavailability. Uh, it, it, it's stronger uh, over time. So that's one of the things about turmeric use for curcumin. It's not used, even though it's anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen and aspirin, it's not something that you just take to deal with a, 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 an immediate problem. It does not absorb that well. So you don't take it at, let's say, my, you know, your elbow hurts, you take a cap of it, and now you feel better like ibuprofen, right? Right. Um, but if you're taking it chronically, then you can actually get those things to heal better. So it was patented for wound healing. It has a nice resolution of inflammation properties, as well as anti-inflammatory properties. So they take a longer time to emerge and the absorption is slower. So, so, so we have data on that, which is in that slide. That was about brain. Uh, one of the nice things, I don't know if Sally presented this or not, were the monkey trials. So they actually did trials in aging monkeys um, in, in Boston, and they used the formulation that we made. This was their initiative. Uh, and then they, they looked for the best, best formulation to test. They tested ours. And they could see a bunch of improvements in, well, well, in memory and motor coordination. So this is age, just aging in primates. Uh, and they saw improved protection of gray matter and white matter, okay? So parts of the brain. So they had basically pretty solid evidence for efficacy with a formulation. So that's how we, why we, one of the reasons that we're fairly confident that this stuff actually has activity. The, that doesn't show you what it does in people until you test it in people. There are some trials like this that show some activity. It's hard to know what this means. This is done in uh, normal people trying to improve function. Uh, and so when you do that, uh, it's, I'd say it's a little sketchy, you know, I mean, it, it shows, you know, test and they've repeated this with a, a second trial and say that they have some evidence for bioactivity. Uh, this kind of thing needs more testing. This is from Sally's trial where uh, the uh, curcumin increased serum BDNF, but that was had a difference in activity in APOE4 carriers. So we're quite interested to understand because we have animal model data, whether having a different genotype. So this would be like the MTHR uh, one difference that was asked about the genetic difference that's present in like half of the Alzheimer population that seems to modify some of the efficacy. So this is also potentially true of many other things. So I had some examples of other things that show differences with APOE4. So there, there are issues with your personal genotype and whether or not things work. So, um, uh, these were my, my conclusions that some supplements are not adequately tested and are, it lead to lawsuits. They're really clearly pretty bogus as far as anybody can tell. There are others that have some pretty good rationales, uh, some rationale for B vitamins, vitamin D and omega-3, but in terms of trying treatment effects in, you know, where it's easier to test, those have been quite mixed. And I don't think that you could expect efficacy for treatment 
one example of combining B vitamins and omega-3 suvenate I covered where they added in something like the CDP choline. That's this cocktail here. Uh, the bottom line is that the lack, lack of adequate testing with individual su supplements, let alone combinations, and then the sub subpopulation and diet differences make it difficult to provide one size fits all recommendations. So in fact, when you you do when you look at the epidemiology, you usually see a difference between the people who have low levels and high levels, say bottom fourth versus top fourth, and you see evidence for efficacy. But then they give the supplement to everybody, and all those people where the epidemiology suggests nothing are included in the trial. So there's an issue with what you're actually taking to begin with, right? And whether or not things work. There may also be true of an interaction with physical exercise. So the Suvenade trials actually worked in Europe and not in the U.S. And they, they were a lot of them were done in Holland where people exercise a lot. And the one in the U.S. didn't work. Nobody knows why, but it could be that you actually need exercise to, to, for, for it to work well, which is what the multi-domain interventions like the finger people are testing. So there are efforts to assess the, 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 the you know, interactions with exercise. The, my sort of final bottom line is that what we need are good blood biomarkers uh, for aging and related disease processes. And then we need to move those into larger studies like the Vital study to actually get information about what which of these things are working and for whom, because they may not work for everybody. They may work for subpopulations. Uh, but the idea that they don't work, I think, is bogus. Um, I think that that the issue is understanding what supplements you could safely use and get results. And, and right. that'll end up having to probably be a bit personalized. Yeah. I, this is this is so informative. I think you've helped us all become better consumers today. I mean, it's, it, in some ways, it's like this issue is far more complex than what, you know, most the media or or a lot of companies even share with people. But I, I think you've really given us some powerful information to be better consumers about this and to help ourselves. And you talked about going to the Vital study, which I uh, tweeted, tweeted, chatted out. What's that website, um, Dr. Cole, that you said is a great resource for people to visit for additional information? It would be, you type NCCIH, that's the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. They have a website that has a bunch of, you know, pages that are specifically designed to deal with these issues. And they will give you the consensus information, uh, which, which is not necessarily always accurate, but it's the best that you could do it, I'd say, for saying, okay, this is what, you know, a panel of... Uh, academic experts would say. Right. And uh, also, if I know that lots of questions came in about uh, turmeric and other diet. And so is it all right if we just ask our, uh, ask the audience here to send them to the Longevity Center, we can forward relevant questions to you? That's fine. I mean, I'm happy to deal with it now or later. It doesn't matter. I mean, and also, well, if you have specifics, the things yeah. you know, I can well, take a look um, at it if you're taking one o'clock. So one o four. Let me. Can I throw one your way? Okay. Um, somebody who asked the very first question is: Is there any particular recommendation for, like, if somebody has Parkinson's disease, you know, or a neuro, another type of neurodegenerative disease? Like, are there particular supplements? that people should be thinking about taking or looking, or let's say getting educated on before they take them? I'd say that, that um, I, I don't think that it, there's, for Parkinson's in particular, I would say that there, there, there's nothing that's really established. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, there are things that have worked in animal models, but they don't have good clinical trial data. Right. For just brain injury, the omega-3 fatty acids look like they do something for for like TBI and brain injury. Parkinson's is sort of it has a, an injury component to it, and and then and the neuro and, and, and so 
omega-3 might have some activity there. Currently, we're interested in the uh, algal omega-3 products that actually have another component called DPAN6 that I didn't discuss. DPAN6 is 40% of the mm, algal DHA uh, in, from, produced by MarTech that puts it in infant formula. So they've done extensive testing on it, so it's safe. That one actually might be useful for Parkinson's, but it, there's not adequate information. That one is currently in trials for Alzheimer's that are run out of the Crosstown competitor USC um, site. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong, uh, but it, 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 we'll see. So they're testing that one for Alzheimer's for, 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 for good reasons. Uh, and we'll see uh, that might have activity that I could discuss, you know, to take a while to explain why, but, but, um, the 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 uh, there's no, nothing that's certain. Curcumin has been used, but not in clinical trials that I know of for Parkinson's. Uh, okay. So the the people what people are working on now in particular are these anti-diabetic drugs uh, mm -hmm. for Parkinson's. They had some somewhat decent results from uh, the insulin sensitizing drug exanatide. And a Hopkins spinoff company is using that for uh, Parkinson's trials now. Uh, so there, there are various versions of that. The, uh, the, the makers, one of the major producers, big pharma producers of that type of product is testing uh, one, of, one of their insulin sensitizing drugs for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So those are not supplements, right? But they're acting on pathways that you could actually engage with supplements. Okay. Sorry for the lack of specificity on that. Uh, no, but I, I think no, what you're okay. saying is that's the state of where we are with so many yep. of these studies and diseases is there is a lack of specificity because they work in, in animals. Does it mean they work in people? What you said about the turmeric and contamination with toxins. I mean, these are things that we need education on the American public. What, what I always think about too, you know, what I've learned from uh, some folks that with the FBI that, that do interventions and, and uh, pursue scammers, right? Is to be aware of the language that's being used in, in these advertisements. Things, anything that claims a cure, uh, you know, miracle, there are certain buzzwords. A lot of people know that, but a lot of people get sucked in by it too. And, uh, and so right away, like it's important to, when you see those words, you know, cures, um, reverses, uh, eliminates, those are, those are red flags, would you say? Yeah, I think that they're, well, they're basically hype. So you look at this hype. from, um, uh, um, many products that you you know the preclinical research on, and you see some supplement maker creating an ad, uh, and they usually exaggerate whatever it did. Um, with the disease like Parkinson's, one of the that you're losing you're losing a, uh, the the neurons that make dopamine, and you're actually losing a lot of them. So the by the time you're getting the disease, you've lost. Uh, maybe 80% of these neurons. Right. So obviously your best bet would be able to see it early and try to prevent that neuron loss that's required to actually lose the inner, the, the, the uh, uh, inputs, lose, lose the pathway inputs, the control that they have. Um, this, you, could, you can, what you're getting along the way is uh, the remaining neurons are taking over the space uh, that, that they're, they're basically taking over the function of the ones that are lost. And to do that, they have to enlarge. So it's quite possible that you could use supplements that facilitate that type of enlargement. Well, so I can get back to you about what plausibility would be with a Parkinson's supplement. Okay. That'd but, be wonderful. You know, the, the, I haven't really been trying to, you know, pursue Parkinson's directly. 
the, you know, the, the big worry would be increasing oxidative damage, which clearly damages those neurons. So you'd want to be careful about that kind of thing. And there's potential for that with various supplements. So, right. So, you know, another big take home message from today is just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. And this is a, a, another kind of hype that's out there that, uh, yeah, so, I would, you know. should mention I, when I was a, when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, there was a talk that Bruce Ames gave called Eat Die. So he just had a big painting of Eat Die at the beginning of it. And he went through the list of all the toxins that are in our, our diet that ran from things that you might know about, like green potatoes and the uh, uh I mean, the, the plants are making insecticides to protect themselves. And they're also making all sorts of things to protect themselves from um, bacteria. And, and, and so they've got a lot of natural products meant to kill things that are their predators. You know, if they're not outright about it with, you know, a bunch of thorns and rip poisonous red berries, they've, they've got something going on. So you they, they're, they're not just randomly making toxins that might kill you. They're deliberately making toxins to kill off the predators that would, that would, would, would you know, give them an advantage if they have something that kills off their predators. So uh, it's, 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 it's entirely understandable and plausible. And there's a long list there of, you know, plant products that have toxic products. Ames's talk was aimed at, at scaring people <laughs> but yeah they should have those little you know when you go to your veterinarian and they have all the plants that are toxic to your cat or dog it's like i think we need one of those for people and yeah. uh you know but yeah. um Put uh, Dr. Cole, like, on the list <laughs> i i can't thank you enough for being here today okay. uh, as you can see we've got 124 people still um, hanging on, um, but I want to be respectful of your time and our audience's time and our staff's time we've been putting on um, this webinar. So I just want to thank everyone. Just rest assured that what we're going to be putting this webinar up on the UCLA Longevity Center website once we get it, uh, you know, edited. So uh, you can watch it again or tell a friend. And don't forget to visit our website where we have our other uh, our other webinars up there as well. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Cole. It was just fabulous to have you. And uh, everybody have a, a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.